All right, engineers, in this video, we're going to talk about the trigeminal nerve or the cranial nerve 5. This is probably one of the most important cranial nerves when it comes to sensations like touch, pain, temperature of the face, and a lot of control with the muscles of mastication, so for our chewing processes. So this nerve we're gonna spend a decent amount of time on because it has a lot of cl clinical correlation with it that can really, really, really be important that we understand, all right? So let's go ahead and get started. So what are we gonna talk about in this video? We're basically gonna discuss the origin of the nerve, where you're gonna find it in the brainstem, okay? You're also gonna talk about the course of the nerve. What are the different branches, which there is a plethora of branches of this nerve. What are the structures that it supplies, which is gonna be a significant amount of structures, and what do those structures do for some of them? And then we're gonna have a little tidbit on clinical correlation specifically with relationship to what's called trigeminal neuralgia, all right? So let's get, and get started. The origin of the nerve is a little bit tricky, and the reason why is there's two points that we have to look at. You know we have what's called a ganglion. How do we define a ganglion? A ganglion is basically a group of cell bodies that are located within the peripheral nervous system. Now, here is going to be a special, special ganglion. And this ganglion here is called the trigeminal ganglion. So it has the cell bodies that are going to be very, very, very important for the actual peripheral processes that are for the branches of the trigeminal nerve. What are these three peripheral processes coming off? One branch is actually gonna be what's called the V1 branch. You know what that stands for for V1? They actually say this is the ophthalmic division. So it's the first division of what cranial nerve? Five. So V1 is the first division of the fifth, can fifth cranial nerve is called the ophthalmic division. The second division of the fifth cranial nerve is going to be the maxillary division. And then the third division of the fifth cranial nerve, or the trigeminal nerve, is going to be the mandibular division. So again, what is V1 here? V1 is ophthalmic. V2 is going to be maxillary. And V3 is going to be mandibular. Okay, so just that we know that, I'm gonna to refer to them as V1, V2, V3. They might use them interchangeably throughout the process of this video, okay? So first things first, these are the peripheral processes. It has to have central processes. Where do these central processes extend to? They extend to the brainstem, and they're very, very widespread. For example, these peripheral processes could come into the brainstem, and they could stretch out to three different nuclei. What are these three different nuclei? Well, there's a nuclei that's located within the medulla. This is probably, of all the nuclei here for the trigeminal nerve, this is probably of the most importance. This is called the spinal nucleus of cranial nerve 5, or the trigeminal nerve. Okay, so it's called the spinal nucleus. Why is this one so important? Because it controls so many things. You don't want to know what it controls? It controls what's called touch, okay, pain, temperature, pressure, and even proprioception of the entire face. Okay, so again, what does it control? Touch, pain, temperature, pressure, and proprioception of the entire face. So whenever these peripheral processes are picking up the sensory information, they're bringing it into the actual brainstem to the spinal nucleus of the trigeminal nerve, and what kind of fibers are coming to this area? Touch fibers, pain fibers, temperature fibers, pressure fibers, and proprioceptive fibers. All right, sweet deal. Another branch could actually go to this actual part here within the pons, because you know this is actually gonna be what part of the brainstem? This is the medulla. This part here is the pons, and this part here is the midbrain, or the mesencephalon, right? And that's an important term, all right? And I'll explain why. But the branch here coming to the pons, they call this, it's kind of in the center, so they can either, you have two names for it, you can either call it the central, or, for whatever reason, they call it the principal, pontine, nucleus of cranial nerve five. So again, you can call it the central or the principal pontine nucleus of cranial nerve five. This one is really important because he's gonna be picking up a little bit of touch and proprioception. So this guy is picking up what type of sensations? He's picking up touch and 
proprioception, okay, of the, of the face, particularly of the jaw. And this last one up here, we said it's within the midbrain, okay? What else could you call the midbrain? You know it's actually derived from what's called the mesencephalon? So because this is a part of the mesencephalon, we actually call this one that the other branches could go to, specifically for proprioception, and this is for proprioception of pretty much the face, this one here is, since it's derived from the mesencephalon, this area of the midbrain, we call this nucleus the, it's a weird one, it's called the mesencephalic nucleus of cranial nerve five. So again, the mesencephalic nucleus of cranial nerve five is picking up proper reception, right, of the face. The central or principal pontine nucleus of cranial nerve five is picking up touch and proper reception from mainly the jaw area. The spinal nucleus of, tri of the trigeminal nerve is going to be picking up touch, pain, temperature, pressure, and proprio reception from the entire face. Now, where do these divisions go? Okay, so we know exactly where we can find these origins, the multiple nuclei. We'll talk about another nuclei right here, the trigeminal motor nucleus, which supplies the first pharyngeal arch. We'll talk about that later when we get to the mandibular division. But now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about this V1 and all the tons of branches it has. Okay, so first off, this V1 branch, the ophthalmic division, it's going to move within this nice dural sinus. What is this dural sinus here called? This dural sinus here is called the cavernous sinus. If you guys have watched the videos on the oculomotor nerve, if you guys have watched on the abducens, and you guys have seen on the trochlear nerve, you guys will become very, very familiar with this. Okay? So what does it stand for? It stands for the cavernous sinus. And the cavernous sinus is really important because it's a dural sinus, which means if you have, you see this brown layer right there? That's called the periosteal layer of the dura mater. And this green layer here that's branching away from it is called the meningeal layer of the dura mater. That's actually located between that actual, between these two structures, between the meningeal layer and the periosteal layer. That's where you'll find this cavernous sinus. Now particularly, it actually is going to run within the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. So this V1 division, the ophthalmic division, is going to move within the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. V2 is also going to move within the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus just below it. But V3, he says, frick that crap, I'm out, and he goes through the foramen ovale. All right? So now, to look at it even better, because we're not really giving it justice to look at it from this view, really quickly, let me say that I actually draw kind of a section here. Let's say here I have the actual sphenoid bone, and then we have here, we have the cella turcica. And if you know here, you'll have like the anterior clenoid processes, anterior clenoid process like this, right? You know that you have what's called the pituitary gland sitting right here. Well, there's actually gonna be a nice little sinus called the cavernous sinus, which sits right in this area here. Sits right in this area. And over here, you have the lateral walls. The lateral walls, if you guys remember, first one was third cranial nerve then fourth cranial nerve, then V1, and then the most inferior one is V2. Same thing on the other side. Three, four, V1, V2. And six is actually moving within the cavity. And if you guys remember, it's always good to be very, very repetitious here. What artery is actually coming up through here with the actual sixth cranial nerve? Or the abducens nerve. It's called the internal carotid artery. You guys remember that the internal carotid artery is moving up through the foramen lacerum, and into the cavernous sinus, the cavity of it. But just so we're clear, V1 and V2 are moving within the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. Sweet deal. As these bad boys move through, what happens is, I should actually bring the V2 division here, because the V2 division, it doesn't come out at the end, it actually gives off about halfway through this point. So along the way, this V2 division, the maxillary division, is going to come out of this cavernous sinus and move out through a hole in the skull called the foramen rotundum. And we'll talk about his branches afterwards. But then this V1, so this is our V2 division, so we keep track of it. This is our V1 division, our ophthalmic division. This bad boy is going to move through a hole in the skull called the superior orbital fissure. Once it gets to this point, it branches out into three different branches that we're going to talk about. Okay, so as it's getting ready to go through the superior orbital fissure, it gives off three branches. So really, if we want to, 
we could say here that this ophthalmic division is really giving off three branches moving into this area here, okay? And we're going to talk about each one of those divisions, that being the nasociliary, the lacrimal, and the frontal. But to see it in an even better way, we're going to look at it here first, but we're going to see it in another view up there in the top right corner in a second. So here we go. Ophthalmic division goes through the superior orbital fissure. When it goes through the superior orbital fissure, like we said, it gives off three branches. Okay, three branches. One of the branches is actually called the lacrimal branch. So it's called the lacrimal branch. So the first branch we're going to have is called the lacrimal branch. The next one, it's a pretty interesting one, the next one is called the frontal branch. The frontal branch. And then this last one over here at the bottom is going to be the nasociliary branch. Ooh, okay. So now, where did these bad boys go? Okay, well the lacrimal nerve is going to move throughout the orbital cavity. And here's what we got to remember. Um, let me actually, before I go and show you exactly where it is, this is not doing it justice to see the exact orientation of how it's coming in. So before we keep going, let's actually come over here to this top right corner so we can see exactly where it's moving out. So I put here, we're actually going to have two parts here. We're going to have a nasal side here, okay? I'm sorry, actually this is going to be over here. This will be the temporal side here. This is going to be on the temporal side of the eye. Okay, and this will be on the nasal side of the eye. Okay, so this will be on the temple side of the eye, this will be on the nasal side of the eye. Here's this hole here. This hole here is called the optic canal. Okay, this big old hole here is called the superior orbital fissure. And again, just in case you guys might be confused, we're taking and looking at the eye, imagine here's my eye, I'm looking into the back of the orbital cavity. So I'm looking in the posterior wall of the orbital cavity. And again, this is the actual temple side of the orbital cavity, this is the nasal side of the orbital cavity, and this is the posterior wall of the orbital cavity. Okay? Now, another structure that's really important is this blue ring, or annulus. This is a nice connective tissue structure called the annulus of Zen or the common tendinous ring. Why is it important? Because it's the origin for four extraocular eye muscles. Which ones? Inferior rectus, lateral rectus, medial rectus, and superior rectus, right? Also, another function of it is that it separates the superior orbital fissure into two compartments. The compartment which is inside of the common tendinous ring and the compartments which is outside of the common tendinous ring. Why am I telling you this? Because the oculomotor nerve, if you remember, has a superior branch an inferior branch, and then you also remember that the sixth cranial nerve was running in this area. But the actual ophthalmic division that gives off those three branches, the nasociliary nerve runs right in between the superior and inferior branch. And then the lacrimal nerve runs here all the way on the temple side of the superior orbital fissure, outside of the common in this ring. The frontal nerve runs just a little bit more medial to that. And then the trochlear nerve runs just a little bit more medial to that. So really, where is the lacrimal nerve coming? It's coming out from the temple side. And it's going to supply a gland that's over here, which is called the lacrimal gland. All right, just so that we're clear on that. So when we see the lacrimal nerve, it's actually coming on the temple side. So in other words, if you're looking at me, you're looking at my eye, it's coming out on this edge of the eye, okay, the lateral side of the eye. All right, sweet. Now that we covered that, let's see what it's going to do here. It's going to come out here. And it's going to do two things. It's actually going to pierce through the lacrimal gland. It's going to pierce through the lacrimal gland. And when it pierces through the lacrimal gland, it's going to give off a branch here to the eyelid. You see right here, this is the superior palpebra or the superior eyelid. This is the inferior palpebra or the inferior eyelid. This guy gives off a branch to supply the skin of the superior palpebra. But you know what else is important? There's actually a conjunctival lining. You know there's what's called the palpebral conjunctiva right here? It supplies that conjunctiva also. So the lacrimal nerve supplies two things. It supplies the skin. So if we imagine coming out over here, it's supplying the skin of the palpebra and it's supplying the underlying conjunctiva. But what part? What part? Imagine over here is temple side of the eye. 
Imagine over here is the medial or nasal side of the eye. Okay? Imagine that. This over here, this is where the lacrimal nerve would be coming. So it'd be coming to supply this part of the palpebra and the underlying conjunctiva. Okay? That's where it would be. So it'd be on the temple side. Sweet deal. We covered that. Now let's do the frontal nerve. The frontal nerve actually comes over here, and there's actually going to be two branches of it. Okay? Two branches of it. You notice know, that's actually called the trochlea right here. There's a little bony structure here called the trochlea, and that's where the superior oblique muscle actually moves through. So here we have the superior oblique, and it actually moves through here to kind of connect onto the actual top part of the eyeball. Well, this nerve runs right above that, right above the trochlea, right above it. So it's called the supratrochlear nerve. Okay, so this one here is called the supratrochlear nerve. And the supratrochlear nerve does the same thing. It supplies the conjunctiva of the upper palpebra. It supplies the skin of the palpebra. And it even supplies the skin of the forehead and a little bit of the scalp. Okay? So this is what nerve right here that's actually moving up here. Let's actually kind of do it like this. Let's put a little thing here. I'm going to put ST, supratrochlear nerve. So supratrochlear nerve there, okay? It's going to move above the trochlea, give uh, branches to the underlying palpebra, the conjunctiva, the skin of the palpebra, and the skin of the actual forehead. The other branch is actually called the supraorbital branch. I'm going to denote that as SO. The supraorbital branch is going to come, it's also going to give supply to the underlying palpebra, the actual palpebral conjunctiva, and the skin of the palpebra. It'll supply the skin of the forehead, and it'll go all the way back. How far back will it go? The supraorbital nerve will actually supply the palpebra, the underlying conjunctiva, the skin of the forehead. This sucker will go all the way back until you get to that, uh, the vertex. Okay, the vertex, so where the actual lambdoid suture is. It goes all the way back there. Whereas the supratrochlear nerve only comes to about, to around the hairline, maybe a little bit above that. Okay? And just to reiterate that, we could actually kind of say it like this. Which one would be right here? We could have supratrochlear nerve, that would come up here. And it would give branches to the palpebra and the underlying conjunctiva. And if you want, we'd also have right here, supraorbital, and this would give conjunctival branches, palpable branches, and it would even go up and supply the actual forehead and all the way back to the vertex of the skull. Sweet deal. So we covered those bad boys. Now we got to go to the monster, unfortunately, the nasociliary. So the nasociliary has a couple branches. Okay, so one of the branches here for the nasociliary is kind of interesting. It actually gives off a branch here. So let's say here's the nasociliary. It actually can give off two branches here. One is going to move with three nerves. I'm going to do them in different colors. So let's say this green nerve is parasympathetic. So I'm going to put PSNS -S nerves. Then I'm going to do here in red, these are going to be identifying sympathetic nerves. So S and S. These guys are going to run together, okay? And then running together, they pierce the actual sclera. So they actually pierce the sclera and they run through the sclera, and what happens is, when they run through the sclera, this actual fiber of the nasociliary fiber comes up and gives supply to the cornea. So it gives specifically touch pain temperature fibers to the cornea. The actual parasympathetic fibers, it'll come through there, and it'll give off branches to the ciliaris and to the iris. Whereas the sympathetic fibers will do the same thing. They'll come here and supply the ciliaris and they'll supply the iris. What is this whole bundle here called? These are basically called your short ciliary nerves. The only reason I mention that is because there's another one called the long ciliary nerves. And the long ciliary nerves is just basically a sympathetic branch. So I'll put S and S. And the nasociliary nerve also piercing together, okay? The long ciliary nerve is just basically going to pretty much be the sympathetic fibers and the nasociliary branch, which will pierce the actual sclera and again, go and supply the cornea, whereas the sympathetic fibers will go and supply 
the ciliaris muscle, and the iris. So what are these ones here called? I'm just going to uh, abbreviate them. Long ciliary nerves. And same thing over here, just so we can save and conserve space. Short ciliary nerves. Okay, sweet. That's that part. Now we get into another one. For the sake of not making it too intense, I'm going to do this one in a different color so that we can definitely follow it. Let me do it in this, uh, in this teal color here. Okay? This is still going to be a part of the nasociliary nerve, but I don't want us to get confused here with all of these other purple fibers moving. So now what happens is the nasociliary nerve is going to give off another branch here. But again, remember, this is still a branch of the nasociliary nerve. And what it does is it moves upwards, okay, towards the ethmoid bone. As it moves upwards, it gives off two branches, okay? One branch is a little bit more posterior. The other branch is a little bit more anterior, towards the ethmoid bone. What do you think they're called? This one here is the posterior ethmoidal nerve. This one there is the anterior ethmoidal nerve. That's it, okay? And they basically, what's their purpose? They're going to supply the sinuses. So they're going to apply, supply the ethmoid sinus. The anterior ethmoidal nerve we'll talk about here in a second. It actually has another branch, three more branches. But again, what's this one here? This is the posterior ethmoidal nerve. This one here is the anterior ethmoidal nerve. Okay? So just so we're clear there, the nasociliary also gives off another branch, which is the posterior ethmoidal nerve, which supplies the posterior ethmoid sinus. It gives off an anterior ethmoidal nerve, which supplies the anterior part of the ethmoid sinus. And again, if you want to know what this big old shark fin-like structure here is, it's just one of the landmarks of the ethmoid bone. It's called the Christagalli. And then this whole plate here, which is having these holes, that plate is called the cribiform plate. Okay, it's called the cribiform plate. And the holes are the olfactory foramina. That's where the olfactory nerves uh, run up through, okay? Just so that you're aware. Okay, so now let's look at the actual branches from that anterior ethmoidal nerve, okay? Because I want to I I show you guys something here. So what happens is, let's say for a second, I actually put a small diagram right over here. A small diagram right over here real quick, okay? So let's say here I'm going to have the, let's say that this is a part of the ethmoid bone with the olfactory foramina on that cribiform plate. And if you remember, what was this structure right here called? This was called the crista galli. Right underneath it is the nasal cavity. Literally, right underneath this is the nasal cavity, okay? So if you imagine here, this is going backwards like that. Again, this is all a part of the nasal cavity. This is the nasal septum right here. And if you remember, we talked about this a couple times, the actual perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone is one component of the nasal septum. The other component is the vomer. Why I'm telling you this is those anterior ethmoidal nerves, remember there was actually coming over here, uh, nasociliary, gives off this branch, which is anterior ethmoidal, posterior ethmoidal. The anterior ethmoidal will actually continue downwards and go into the nasal cavity. When it goes into the nasal cavity, it gives off three branches. Okay? One is supplying the medial side of the nose. So it's called the medial nasal branch. I'm just going to put M N B, medial nasal branch. The other one is supplying the lateral side of the nasal cavity, lateral nasal branch. But this one is probably of the most interesting. This one is actually going to continue and it's going to pierce through a part of the nose and supply the tip of the nose. It's going to supply the tip of the nose. You know where there's the cartilage of the nose and the bone of the nose? There actually is a kind of separation point. It pierces right through that, the separation point between the bone and the cartilage. And it supplies mainly the tip of the nose. Okay? So this one right there is called the external nasal nerve. Okay? Just so we're clear, this right here is the anterior ethmoidal nerve. This one right there. This is the posterior ethmoidal nerve. The anterior ethmoidal nerve will give branches to supply the ethmoid sinus. It'll give off a medial nasal branch, which is for touch pain temperature of that area, lateral nasal branch, which is for touch pain temperature there, and an external nasal branch, which will be for the touch pain temperature for the tip of the nose. All right, sweet goodness, we got that one. 
Okay, that's kind of a tough one there. Now let's do another one. One more branch of this guy and the ophthalmic division is complete. Okay, so if we go here next, we're gonna have another branch of the nasociliary nerve. What's gonna happen is this branch, okay, it's not going through the eye, so don't get that confused. I'm just doing it for the sake of the diagram. It's not going through the eye. It's actually moving underneath the trochlea. Remember this one was moving above the trochlea, so it was called the supratrochlear nerve? This bad boy right here is going underneath the trochlea. So this one is called the what? Infratrochlear nerve. Infratrochlear nerve. Why am I telling you this one? Because the infratrochlear nerve is also really, really important. It's going to give a couple different branches. Okay? Remember how this was the superior palpable was supplied by the supratrochlear, the supraorbital, and even the lacrimal? The infratrochlear nerve is very nice, and he gives a couple different branches. Okay? Best seen in this view here. Best seen in this view. Remember there was actually called a certain part of the eye over here. You have a certain structure here called the lacrimal caruncle. Okay, kind of a nice little fleshy part there. Then if you guys have seen our videos, um, we talk about the eye, we know that we have these little canals over here called the lacrimal puncta, and then you have the lacrimal canaliculi, which goes into the lacrimal sac, right? Well, what happens is, son of a gun, the infratrochlear nerve is going to give two different things. It's going to supply the palpebra, the superior palpebra, okay, more medial. It's also going to supply the lacrimal caruncle. So it's going to supply that lacrimal caruncle. And it's going to give supply over here to the lacrimal sac. Okay, so what three structures is it going to supply? The infratrochlear nerve is going to supply the palpebra, the most medial part of the palpebra, and the underlying conjunctiva. It's going to give supply to the lacrimal sac, and it's going to give supply to the lacrimal caruncle, that little fleshy, beady part in the middle of your eye. Okay? All right, sweet deal. So we covered that one. So the infratrochlear nerve will give off branches to supply the palpebra, underlying conjunctiva. It'll also give off a branch for the lacrimal sac, and it'll give off a branch for the, what else? The lacrimal caruncle. So lacrimal sac and caruncle, the lacrimal caruncle. And again, these are basically your touch, pain, temperature, and pressure fibers. Holy sweet goodness, we have done the ophthalmic division. Okay, unfortunately, that's not the worst of it. <laughs> All right, so, so far we've covered the ophthalmic division. Sweet deal. Now let's go ahead and move on to the actual maxillary division. The maxillary division is a little bit tough, I'm not going to lie. So we're going to try to go through this piece by piece the best we can. All right, so we said that the V1 went through the superior orbital fissure, right? The V2 moves to this nice little hole in the skull, and this hole right here is called the foramen rotundum. This is where the actual maxillary division runs through. As the maxillary division is running through, it gives off a recurrent branch here. It gives off a nice little recurrent branch. And this recurrent branch is going to supply, what is this here? Your meninges. It's going to supply the dura mater because the dura mater is pain sensitive. So one branch here is going to be what's called the meningeal branch. So you're going to give off what's called a uh, meningeal or a dural branch. Okay, so meningeal branch or a dural branch. We can even say dural branch. Because specifically, it's supplying the dura mater, not the um, arachnoid mater and the pia mater. Okay? All right, sweet. Then, as it comes out of the foramen rotundum, it moves into a special structure that is kind of interesting. It's actually called the, this little fossa here. It's kind of a little bit posterior to the orbital cavity and a little bit more inferior to it. This cavity right here, or fossa, is called the pterygo, it's actually right above it, pterygo palatine fossa. And this is probably a really, really interesting one. And the reason why is because it has a, some ganglion in here. So it actually does have uh, some ganglion. Here. So what is a ganglion again? It's a group of cell bodies located within the peripheral nervous system. 
Now what happens is this actual max layer division is going to move through the pterygopalatine fossa, but it does give off some branches here to the pterygopalatine ganglion. So what is that green group of cell bodies there located within that area? This right here is called the pterygopalatine ganglion. So I'm going to put pterygo palatine ganglion. A little lazy, don't want to write all that in there. Pterygopalatine ganglion. A group of cell bodies are located within the PNS. So it does give off some branches there. But then what happens is from here it gives off three branches. Bop, bop, bop. Okay, so three branches here. One branch is called the posterior superior alveolar nerve. So one of the branches here, and I'm, I'm going to put posterior superior alveolar nerve. Okay? The other one is called the infra orbital nerve. And the last one here is called the zygomatic nerve. Now, what happens is the zygomatic nerve and the infraorbital nerve run up into the orbital cavity through this little hole in the bottom part. You know how this was called the superior orbital fissure? This is the inferior orbital fissure. So the zygomatic nerve, okay, so now that we know what they are, and I've written them down, let's abbreviate them for space sake, right? So zygomatic nerve here and infraorbital nerve, these two are going to move through the inferior orbital fissure. Okay, what is that hole there called? Inferior orbital fissure. Okay. Cool. Now the zygomatic nerve, as it runs through here, it gives off two branches. Okay, we're not going to be able to see them very, very well here. I'll show you in another diagram in just a second here. But it's going to get off one branch. I'm going to denote it ZT because we're going to talk about it called the zygomaticotemporal branch and another one called the ZF, which is the zygomatical facial branch. The other one is going to give this guy here, this infraorbital nerve. And what happens is the infraorbital nerve is going to run on the, uh, the floor of the orbital cavity. They call it like, the infraorbital like, groove. But then what happens is it moves through a hole right here. There's a tiny little hole underneath the orbit, about right here. Okay? It's called the infraorbital foramen. So let's kind of make this nice little hole here. Here's our infraorbital foramen. This guy goes through this hole here called the infraorbital foramen and gives off three branches. One branch is going to go here and supply the inferior palpebra, right? And the underlying conjunctiva. I just get so excited about this, I'm sorry. Another branch is going to continue downwards and supply the upper lips. It's going to supply the upper lip. And the other branch is going to go and supply the actual nose. So it gives off three branches. One is an inferior palpable branch. The other one is a nasal branch. And the third one is going to be the, you know, you can call uh, lips. You can also call them labia. All right. It doesn't mean that you have a vagina on your face. It just means it's lips. Lips is labia. So you have the superior labial branches. Okay. All right. All right, so we got that. That's the infraorbital nerve. Now, we, I said I was going to talk to you about the zygomatical temporal and the zygomatical facial. I was going to show you in a different way because this does not do it justice here. So let me do that real quick on this bottom uh, guy here with the Mississippi mud flap. Okay? What happens is you're going to have two branches here. Let's say it's coming from the orbital cavity right here. One branch is going up, and it's supplying the temple. That's it. It's supplying the temple. That's the zygomatical temporal branch. The other branch is coming over here and supplying mainly the cheek area. Okay, so the zygomatic bone, a little bit of the cheek area. That's the zygomatical facial branch. That's it. Done. It's supplying touch, pain, temperature, pressure, fibers to the. If it's here, it's zygomatical facial. If it's here, it's zygomatical temporal. Done. That's it. Okay. Like I said, seeing it like this does not do it justice. So we show you do like that right there. Okay. Fortunately, still not done. Okay, now from the infraorbital nerve, okay, so let's put it here again so we don't confuse that this one is right here, just kind of putting it in between as an intermediate, IO, infraorbital nerve, okay? It gives off two more branches. 
I did not show you what the posterior superior alveolar nerve is doing though. This is probably something I should show you. It comes over here and it gives supply to the hard palate, a little bit of the teeth, but what teeth is it really, really supplying? The molars. So this guy right here is supplying the molars. So it's supplying the actual molars and you know there's the, the skin coming right up over the teeth, the gingiva, it's supplying that too. So it's giving even a little bit of supply to the actual tissue over that area, which is called the gingiva. Supplying the molars and the gingiva. Okay, that's the posterior superior alveolar nerve. And just to be uh, save space as much as we possibly can here, let's put this as PSA. Okay, not prostate specific antigen. Okay, this is gonna be posterior superior alveolar nerve, all right? So posterior superior alveolar nerve. Now, the reason I'm putting it like this is because there's off the infraorbital nerve is two branches. So off of this bad boy here, you're gonna give two branches. This one here and this one here. Since this one's coming right in the middle, so this is posterior, this would be anterior, and this is middle. So I'm gonna put here that we know it's the middle superior alveolar nerve. This one is going to be the anterior superior alveolar nerve. The middle superior alveolar nerve is supplying the premolars. And again, the actual gingiva um, around it. Okay, so even the gingiva. The anterior superior alveolar nerve is gonna supply the canines right? The canines and even the incisors, the central incisors and the lateral incisors. And just in case for those of you who are like, you, know, you can also call, you know, you have what's called the cuspids and the bicuspids if you want to call them that too for, you know, you can actually call, again, you have central and lateral incisors, you have the canines and you have the cuspids and the bicuspids too. But again, I'm just going to say here, cane, I'm going to keep it simple, canines, incisors, premolars and molars. And again, you have three molars, two premolars, and then you have the actual two canines here and then the actual two central incisors and two lateral incisors. Okay, so that's gonna be supplied by these guys. All right, so that's the big part of the, the maxillary branches. There's a couple other parts that we have to cover though. And it's coming from this ganglion area, okay? So from this ganglion, there's gonna be a couple different branches that are coming out here, okay? So coming through that pterygopalatine ganglia, there's gonna be a couple different branches that we have to talk about. All right, here we go. One branch is actually going to come down here and give supply to the nasopharynx. So one branch is gonna come down here and it's gonna supply the nasopharynx. Nasopharyngeal branch. Another interesting point here is if you guys remember the uh, eustachian tube or the pharyngotympanic tube or the auditory tube, you know that there's actually the little exit of that pharyngotympanic tube right here, right? And then right around it, you know, you have like the, uh, the tonsils, the tubal tonsils. There's a little tubal tonsils that are actually lymphatic tissue wrapping right around this area. This guy here, this actual nasopharyngeal branch, is gonna give some fibers that'll come over here and supply the pharyngotympanic tube and maybe a little bit of the skin over the tubal tonsils, okay? So the nasal pharyngeal branch is gonna supply the nasopharynx. It's gonna give some branches to the pharyngotympanic tube and maybe even a little bit of the skin of the tubal tonsils there. All right, that's that bad boy. All right, let's see if we can do this one here. Let's do another one here, this branch here. This branch here is gonna come into the orbital cavity, okay? And it's gonna give a touch pain temperature supply to the actual orbit. So it's gonna give touch pain temperature to the actual orbital cavity. So touch pain temperature fibers to the orbital cavity. So what would you call this branch? Since we know that this is called the pterygopalatine fossa, I'm gonna get this out of the way. This is actually called the orbital branch. So this one right here is called the orbital branch. Okay, then we have another one here. Okay, let's see if we can get this bad boy here. Another one here is gonna come 
from the back here. It's going to come out the back here, and it's going to move. Let's see if we can follow this one down here. This guy's going to come, and it's going to supply the soft palate and a little bit of the actual uh, uvula. Okay, So this guy here is going to come and supply the actual soft palate. This one here is called the lesser palatine nerve. Okay, so this one here is called the lesser palatine nerve. Holy crap, we're doing all right here. Okay, so we got a nasopharyngeal branch, we got a lesser palatine nerve, which is supplying the soft palate, and then we also have the orbital branch, which is supplying the actual orbital cavity. Okay, we have another one here that's going to move with that lesser palatine nerve in a, in a similar way. Okay, let's see if we can get this bad boy in here now. Okay, here we go. This next one here, we're going to bring him downwards. And this one's going to move next to the actual lesser palatine. And when it does, it's going to go and it's going to only supply the actual hard palate. Okay, so it's going to supply the posterior part of the hard palate. So again, what is this nerve here called? This one is called the greater palatine nerve. Okay, so let's recap here. How many branches do we have coming off of this ganglion or these ganglionic branches? We have an orbital branch, which is one, supplying the orbital cavity. We have the nasopharyngeal branch, which is supplying the nasopharynx, the pharyngeal tympanic tube, and a little bit of the tubal tonsils. We have the lesser palatine nerve, which is going to be supplying the soft palate. We have the greater palatine nerve, which is supplying the posterior part of the hard palate. There's another one, but this one's really hard to see from this angle. And plus with all this gibberish we got going on here. So what we're going to do is we're going to come over here for a second to a mini diagram. Okay? So a mini diagram over here. Again, what was this here called? This is called the pterygopalatine fossa with the pterygopalatine ganglion. And again, what nerve was running through here? This was your maxillary division. And it gave off those ganglionic branches, right? Remember, some of the branches will actually move through. When they move through, they empty into the posterior part of the nasal cavity. So they come into the posterior part of the nasal cavity. So since they come into the posterior and even a little bit upper, so I could actually kind of show it like this. So posterior, and it's up, actually in the upper parts of the nasal cavity. So this is called the posterior superior nasal branch. So this is the posterior superior nasal branch. What happens is it actually gives off two branches here, one like this and one like this. One is going to supply the medial wall, so this would be called the medial nasal branch. Another one is going to supply the lateral wall, so this would be a lateral nasal branch. And then it'll have another one, another guy, which is actually going to go through a hole in the actual hard palate. There's a nice little hole within the hard palate here. What is that hole here called? This hole is actually called the incisive fossa or you know, foramen. And the text that I read it was the incisive fossa. And it comes out and supplies the hard palate but specifically the anterior hard palate. The greater palatine supplied the posterior hard palate. So again, how many branches off of this sucker here? So again, this branch was the, well, how many branches is that? That was three, four. So we had how many again? We had orbital branch. We had the nasopharyngeal branch. We had the lesser palatine, greater palatine. This is the fifth one, okay? So the fifth one is going to be the posterior superior nasal branch, which gives off a medial nasal branch, which supplies the medial walls of the nasal cavity the lateral nasal branch, which supplies the lateral walls of the nasal cavity, and this other one that moves through the incisive fossa and into the actual oral cavity to supply the hard palate. What is this bad boy here? This one right here is called the nasopalatine nerve. Okay. And if you guys are interested, I know you guys are, the hole that this guy's go into 
to get into the actual uh, nasal cavity area is called the sphenopalatine foramen. They actually go through what's called the sphenopalatine foramen. Okay. All right, that covers that. Holy crap, guys, we did the maxillary division. Let's keep going. We're almost done. We're at the home stretch here. Let me get this out of the way so that now we can do the mandibular division. And this one's not that bad. Of all of them, it's probably one of the easier ones. And we're going to introduce a new concept here. Okay, so we got V3. V3 moves through a nice little structure here. And it actually moves through a hole in the skull here called the foramen oval. There's a lot of other structures that move through this area also, but we're not going to spend any time talking about that. Okay, here's what we got to uh, talk about now. And I want to do this one. We're going to do it in black. We'll do it in black. From this guy here, so let's actually make this nucleus black here. This nucleus here is the motor nucleus of the trigeminal nerve. So this is actually going to be the uh, cranial nerve 5 motor nucleus. And so what happens is it gives off motor fibers. And these motor fibers, and this black is good, it actually is going to move through the foramen ovale. It moves through the foramen ovale with this actual sensory division. You know what? Shame on me that I didn't tell you what kind of fibers these guys were. You see these actual purple fibers? I told you that they're touch, pain, temperature, proprioception, all that stuff like that. But they're even more specific. These type of fibers are actually called GSA fibers, which means that they're consisting, they're called their general somatic afferents, which are touch, pain, temperature, proprioception, pressure fibers, right? These black fibers here are called SVE fibers. And the reason why is they're called spe uh, special visceral efferents is because these guys supply what's called the first pharyngeal arch. There's actually during embryonic development, you have these things called pharyngeal arches. Uh, there's the first, second, third, fourth, and sixth. And what happens is the actual uh, special visceral efferent fibers from the uh, trigeminal motor nucleus supplies the first pharyngeal arch, which is the muscles of mastication, the tensor veli palatini, and the tensor tympani. And we'll talk about that. Okay, so cool. We got that. So now what happens is it moves through the foramen ovale. But then we have to give off a branch here. So there's actually an artery that comes here up through this area here. It's actually a branch off of the um, external carotid artery. Very, very important artery, especially when it comes to what's called um, epidural hematomas that can develop. This right here is called the middle meningeal artery. It actually runs up through that area and actually goes into this nice space here, which is called a nice little epidural space. That's why if you ever get hit really, they actually run right through the temple. Very, very, this is the most common part for the epidural hematoma. If you get hit really, really hard there, you can actually rip through the middle meningeal artery and cause blood to accumulate and lead to a hematoma that can compress the brain and cause an in increased intracranial pressure. But anyway, we're not talking about that. I'm just saying here that it runs up through this area. What happens is it gives off fibers that move with it through the dura mater. Okay, gives off fibers that move with it within that dura mater. This branch here is called the nervous spinosis. I'm, okay, so it's called the nervous, actually I think there is a U, yes, yeah, spinosis. So it's called the nervous spinosis. That's one branch. As it moves through, it gives off another branch. Okay, so it's going to come down here. It's going to give off this branch that moves with the middle meningeal artery called the nervous spinosis. It's also going to give off another branch back here. It gives off another branch here that's going to move all the way out here and come and supply, this is a heck of a journey, the ear. Okay, so it's going to supply the external ear. Okay, so it's going to supply the external ear, and this is called the auriculotemporal nerve. So you can already also get from this that it's not just supplying the actual external ear. If you imagine that this is a part of the temple, it would give off branches to the temple region also. Okay, so the fascia there where the temple is. 
Okay, auriculotemporal nerve, that's another branch. And again, these are still GSA fibers. But as it moves downwards, let's follow these motor fibers now. These motor fibers, they come through this area and they give off a boatload of branches here. I mean, I shouldn't say boatload, they give off three branches, okay? One branch is gonna go and supply a lot of these muscles of mastication. Another branch is gonna go to the tongue and another branch we'll talk about in a second, it'll actually go and supply some of the actual teeth. Okay, so let's go through each branch here. Let's do, let's actually follow this bad boy, we'll do that one later, let's follow this one right now. We're gonna say that this one is the branch to the muscles of mastication, since they're right here. This is a, a way better view here, okay? So there's a couple muscles of mastication here. Let's actually highlight them. This one right here is supposed to be the masseter. This one right here is going to be the temporalis. This one here is going to represent the, and again, this is not anatomically perfect. I'm doing it so we can get the point here. This is going to supply the lateral pterygoid. And this one right here is going to be the medial pterygoid. This bad boy here, this branch, which is actually um, a part of the anterior division of this uh, motor fibers, right? It's gonna give off a nerve that supplies the actual temporalis. This nerve is called the, I'm gonna abbreviate it, deep temporal nerve. So it's gonna give off a branch called the deep temporal nerve. It's gonna give off another branch, which is gonna come over here to the masseter. What do you think this one's called? This is called the masseteric nerve. Masseteric nerve. It's gonna keep going down here, and it's gonna also give off a fiber here that is actually on its own. It's not a part of the anterior vision. So let me actually kind of put like a, a little asterisk a part of this one. This is a, not a part of the anterior division. This masseteric nerve is a part of the anterior division. This one is actually just an individual branch here to the medial pterygoid. And then it's gonna get off another branch which is a part of the anterior division, which is gonna to go to supply the actual lateral pterygoid, okay? This is actually called the nerve to lateral pterygoid. I'm gonna put NLP, nerve to lateral pterygoid. What also happens is it gives off one more branch here, but really we should actually be specific because this branch, it actually, it's, it's a weird one. It's a really weird one here, okay? It gives off another branch to the lateral pterygoid, but the fibers that are moving with it, it actually has some sensory fibers here that are moving with it here. And these sensory fibers are gonna go and supply the cheek, okay? So really, as it's moving here, if I follow these actual purple fibers up back all the way here, some of these actual general somatic afferent fibers are actually moving and gives off a branch here to the lateral pterygoid and gives off a branch to supply the skin of the cheek. This branch here is called the buccal nerve, okay? It does not supply the buccinator. That's the actual function of the facial nerve, okay? So again, which ones are being supplied? Temporalis by the deep temporal nerve. Medial pterygoid, which is not a part of the anterior division. Masseteric nerve, which is actually a part of the anterior division. Lateral pterygoid, through the nerve to the lateral pterygoid. And then there's gonna be another branch off the buccal nerve, which is gonna supply the lateral pterygoid. And then the buccal nerve is also gonna have a sensory branch which supplies the skin of the cheek. Holy crap, we did that. Okay. Now, Let's keep her going here. Let's keep her going. And let me actually kind of make sure that all of these branches here are separate here from this three branches, because we made three branches here. So really this is the one branch here. So we should have it all like this. That's better. Okay, I just gotta be picky, okay? Because again, this was one branch that was actually going to supply all of these muscles of mastication. There's another branch which is gonna be for the lingual nerve and another branch which is gonna supply specifically the teeth and even the skin of the chin. Okay, we'll talk about that. Holy crap, let's follow this one here. This one here is gonna continue and it's gonna move through a hole within the mandible. 
there's a nice little hole here within the mandible that it's going to move through. What is that hole there called? It's called the mandibular foramen. So it moves through a hole called the mandibular foramen. And as it's moving this way, it actually is going to give off branches that come over here to supply the teeth. So it's going to give branches that come over here to supply the teeth. What is this branch here called? This branches that are actually coming off of that is called the inferior dental nerves. So they're called the inferior dental nerves. As we continue from that point, there's going to be fibers that are going to come out through another hole within the mandible. What is that hole there called? That hole is called the mental foramen. So it's called the mental foramen. Out of that, you're going to have the mental nerves coming through here. The mental nerve is going to supply the skin of the chin. So it's going to supply the skin of the actual chin, or as we call it, the mental region. Okay? So again, this nerve here is going to move through the mandibular foramen. It's going to give off inferior dental nerves, and then it's going to continue out through the actual mental foramen and give off these mental nerves, which are going to supply the skin of the actual chin. Now, it also gives off another branch that comes over here and supplies two other muscles. Two other muscles here. One muscle we're going to draw like this, and we're going to say that there's another one moving like this. And these are both connecting to a bone right here. I'm going to put the bone right here. This bone is the only bone in the body that doesn't articulate with any other bone in the body. Okay, so this is actually going to be a bone that articulates with no other bone in the entire body. This is called the hyoid bone. This is going to give off branches to two muscles. One is going to be going to the stylohyoid. So this muscle right here is called the stylohyoid. The other one, I'm sorry, not the stylohyoid. This is actually called the mylohyoid. I'm sorry about that. It gives off one branch which goes to a muscle called the mylohyoid. It gives off another branch which is going to the digastric anterior belly. Okay, this nerve here, which is coming off, is actually called the mylohyoid nerve. So this one's called the mylohyoid nerve, this one right there. This nerve, though, which was actually moving all this way, this bad boy right there, this is called the inferior alveolar nerve. Okay? So just to recap that, we have the inferior alveolar nerve. It's going to move through the mandibular foramen. It gives off a branch called the mylohyoid nerve, which supplies the mylohyoid and the digastric anterior belly, which are superhyoid muscles. So they elevate the hyoid bone. It's going to give off another branch, which is the inferior dental nerves, which are going to supply the teeth. And it's going to give off another branch, which is going to be through the mental nerve, which supplies the skin of the uh, chin. Now really, moving through here, if we were to really be specific, the purple fibers are the ones that are the GSA fibers, right? So really, if we really wanted to be particular here, all of these fibers here that are actually coming off to the teeth are really the GSA fibers. And then the actual fibers that are coming out to supply the skin of the chin are also GSA fibers. The only motor fiber is the one that's going to the mylohyoid nerve. Okay, just so we're clear on that. Okay, so again, this would all be GSA fibers. And the black ones are going to be the SVE fibers. Holy crap, we're almost done, guys, I promise. We have another one. This one right here is going to be a really cool one, and this is called the lingual nerve. The lingual nerve will move down. Okay, it'll continue downwards, and as it's moving downwards, it's actually going to go and supply the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. So this is going to be the lingual nerve, and the lingual nerve specifically is going to be taking 
GSA fibers. So if we're being really, really particular here, this black nerve really should be purple if we really wanna be particular because we've been keeping the GSA fibers here purple. So we should actually make this purple here too. So really, the lingual nerve is actually GSA fibers. And these GSA fibers here are actually going to give what? Touch pain temperature fibers to what? The anterior two-thirds of the tongue, okay? So it's gonna be giving touch pain temperature fibers to the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. So again, that's the lingual nerve. Now, why am I mentioning this? Because there's something else that moves with it. Okay, so another nerve that's really worth mentioning is going to be the seventh cranial nerve. Okay, I'm not mentioning these things just for my own sake. I'm doing it because I really, I really want this to make sense, guys. So the seventh cranial nerve is going to move through this bony canal within the middle ear. And this bony canal within the middle ear is called the facial canal. We actually have a video on uh, the middle ear anatomy with the external ear. Okay? Now what's important is, as this seventh cranial nerve is running through here, let's say that this is actually going to be, I'm going to put M for motor fibers. There's going to be other ones that are moving with it. What else would be nice and bright? Let's use this nice teal color here to go with it. Let's say over here we're going to have sensory fibers. So this is going to be sensory fibers. These are going to also be moving with the motor fibers of the seventh cranial nerve. Okay? Okay? There's another one here, which we're going to make here in brown. And these are going to be the parasympathetic fibers. So we have three fibers so far moving through this area. Motor fibers, we're going to have parasympathetic fibers and these actual sensory fibers. What happens is the parasympathetic fibers and the sensory fibers come out of the bony canal. So they come out of the bony canal. So let's actually say here's the parasympathetic fibers. They come out of the bony canal and they go through a hole within the posterior wall of the middle ear. So this is the middle ear here again. It comes through this hole within the posterior wall called the posterior canal liculus. So that little hole in the back is called the posterior canal liculus. And these fibers move anteriorly and come out the anterior canal liculus of the middle ear. Why am I telling you this? Because with it, these teal fibers are moving. So look at this. These teal fibers also decide to peel off and come out with this area too with these actual parasympathetic fibers. This whole thing here that's moving like a cord within the middle ear is called the corda tympani. So again, what is this structure right here called? This whole structure here is called the corda tympani. These fibers are going to move with the actual lingual nerve. So now we got to bring this bad boy up through this way. So I'm going to bring this fiber up here, and I'm going to bring the teal fibers up there. And again, the, the doo, doo brown fibers are going to be what? The doo, doo brown fibers are representing the parasympathetic fibers. The teal fibers are representing the sensory fibers. These all run with the lingual nerve. So they hop on with the lingual nerve and move with the lingual nerve. Okay, so let's actually follow these teal fibers all the way down here. Okay, these teal fibers are sensory fibers. When they move with the lingual nerve, they come all the way out here to the tongue, to the anterior two thirds of the tongue where the lingual nerve is. And what they're specifically doing is these teal fibers that are part of the facial nerve, they're picking up taste. They're picking up taste. But again, that's for the facial nerve. I just want you to realize that with the lingual nerve, these SVA fibers, which are taste fibers, these teal fibers, are moving with it. The other fibers that are moving with it are these doo, -doo brown fibers. And they'll continue and eventually come out in synapse and a ganglion called the submandibular ganglion. And they'll go out to glands. Okay, just in this case, it's going to be called submandibular salivary and submandibular ling. I'm sorry, not submandibular lingual, submandibular salivary glands and sublingual salivary glands. And this is going to cause the production of saliva. Okay, 
So just so we're clear here, the lingual nerve is picking up two fibers from the facial nerve. This is the lingual nerve here. And within the lingual nerve, it's carrying with it two fibers from the corda tympana that hop on. The fibers here, the brown ones, are the parasympathetic nervous system fibers. They're to cause the salivation. The teal fibers are going to be the SVA fibers, and these are taste fibers. But remember, this is not a part of the fifth cranial nerve. This is for cranial nerve seven. But they're moving on the link with the lingual nerve, which is a part of cranial nerve five. Okay? Just so that we are completely clear. Okay. One more, and we're done. One more, guys. One more muscle. As it's coming through this area, it gives off another little individual branch here. It gives off another little individual branch here which comes to this muscle right here. This is called the pharyngeal tympanic tube. There's a muscle that's right superiorly to it. It's going to be right above it. This muscle here is called the tensor tympani. And the tensor tympani, actually, it connects to a bone. It's going to be hard to see from this angle because we've pretty much flooded the board with information, so there's like nowhere else to draw. But I want you to trust me for right now that this tensor tympani is actually attaching to a bone, a little ossicle inside of the middle ear cavity called malleus. And what it does is it pulls malleus medially, which tenses up the tympanic membrane because malleus is connected to the tympanic membrane. When it tenses the tympanic membrane, it makes the tympanic membrane very, very tense and very less sensitive to compression and decompression. What's the purpose of that? To make the actual sound waves less, uh, less intrusive. What do I mean? Whenever you're chewing food, this, this nerve is caught helping the actual mastication process. You know how loud it would be if we didn't have this tensor tympani functioning while we're chewing? It would be so loud. We would hear ourselves so loudly chewing. So thank goodness for this trigeminal nerve innervating the tensor tympani, pulling on the malleus medially to tense the tympanic membrane to dampen some of the sounds whenever we're chewing. All right, so last thing I want to talk about to finish everything off, and I thank you guys for sticking in there with me throughout this whole process. It's absolutely amazing if you guys have stuck in there. The actual last thing I want to talk about is called trigeminal neuralgia, which was that last clinical correlation that I wanted to discuss. So trigeminal neuralgia. And this is not going to, we're not going to have a whole long discussion. I'm just basically going to give you the synopsis version of it. Okay. There's specific arteries. Okay. One is called the superior cerebellar artery. If you guys remember, we've talked about this so many times. There's a vessel moving right here called the superior cerebellar artery. And if you guys remember, there was also another one called the posterior cerebral artery. We talked about this in oculomotor nerve and trochlear nerve. This SCA, the superior cerebellar artery, is the most common, okay, there's two causes of trigeminal neuralgia, generally. One is idiopathic, okay? So one is idiopathic, meaning it could be anything, you're not really completely sure. But that only accounts for 10% of that, the causes. So 10% of it is kind of like idiopathic. The other 90% of trigeminal neuralgia is due to the superior cerebellar artery actually compressing the nerve root. So imagine here that this superior cerebellar artery is actually compressing the nerve root, okay? For whatever reason, the loop of that superior cerebral artery is compressing the actual uh, nerve root. Now, which areas of the trigeminal nerve are most commonly affected? Any branch could be affected, but the two most common branches that are affected in trigeminal neuralgia is V2 and V3. Okay, so in trigeminal neuralgia, 90% of the uh, cases is due to superior cerebellar artery compression of the nerve root. 10% is idiopathic. Most common areas affected is the actual maxillary division and the mandibular division. Okay, that's that. How would these patients be presenting? They would be presenting with excruciating, lancinating, stabbing, cutting pain that radiates from the jaw up to the ear up to the actual nasal cavity, even up to the eye. And it can last for seconds, even up to about a minute or two minutes. It is extremely painful. And it can actually happen up to 100 times a day. Okay? So this can happen almost 100 times a day. Could you imagine that amount of pain? They say it's one of the most excruciating pains a person can go through. Okay, so 
how they treat this is a couple different ways, generally. We're not going to go through every single part of it. I'm just going to say that there's a couple ways to treat it. Um, one is you can do it with medicine. Okay, you can medically manage it by giving them what's called uh, carbamazepine, which is an anticonvulsant. You can also give them another one called gabapentin. They're not really sure of how uh, the mechanisms of these are working, but they know that it actually does help to be able to reduce some of the pain in this, uh, the spasms that are coming from the trigeminal neuralgia. Or you could do surgical intervention. Okay, and the most common one that they usually do is actually what's called a surgical decompression. Okay, so a microvascular surgical decompression surgery. And they actually go in and alleviate that, that loop, that artery, that's actually compressing on the actual nerve root, they get rid of it. Or they could do what's called radio frequency ablation, where they hit it with radio waves to destroy it. Or they can do what's called gamma knife surgery, okay? Where you hit it, you hit a specific area of where the actual damage is, where the actual, uh, all this trigeminal nerve root is being damaged, you hit it with small amounts of gamma rays and actually destroy the actual tissue, okay? But it's very, very pinpoint focused. So in conclusion, trigeminal neuralgia is a very lancinating, cutting, stabbing pain that's radiating from the actual jaw, up to the ear, up to the actual uh, maxillary region, up to the eye, nasal cavity, and it is extremely painful. It can last from seconds to minutes, almost 100 times a day. 90% of the cases is due to a superior cerebellar artery compression of the nerve root. 10% could be idiopathic. The most common areas affected is V2 and V3, and you treat them usually with carbamazepine or gabapentin, which is basically anticonvulsants, or you can do a surgical decompression surgery, and if necessary, you might even have to do some type of radio frequency ablation. And engineers, I hope all of this made sense. I really do hope you guys enjoyed it. If you guys stuck in the whole time in this video, I can't thank you enough. All right, engineers, as always, until next time.